Hey everyone, welcome to our ongoing midweek teaching series on spiritual formation. We've called this series Reflections on Spiritual Formation. My name is DJ Martin. I'm a church pastor here at Parker Ford Church. Whether you're a member of Parker Ford or just joining us online, we're so glad to have you with us as we continue this series. We've been in this series for a long time now. Uh, all of 2021, we've been in exploring the topic of spiritual formation during our midweek teachings. How we're going to kind of wrap up this series is talking about our sonship, our identity as children of God. If you watched last week's teaching, awesome. If you didn't, before engaging this week's teaching, I would really encourage you to go back and engage last week's teaching. Uh, today and next week will be parts two and three of this ongoing teaching about being children of God. So this is child of God part two. Last week we started with a verse from Ephesians that talks about our adoption into the family of God as children. Today I wanted to look at another pivotal passage about our adoption as children of God. It comes from Galatians chapter four. The apostle Paul writes in verse four of chapter four, but when the set time had fully come or, or the fullness of time had come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. This, uh, this, this topic of spiritual sonship, of becoming children of God, is absolutely vital. It's foundational. It's pivotal. It's step one in understanding who we are in Christ. It is so key. It is so important to the topic of spiritual formation because we are being formed. His desire is to form us and conform us into the image of his son by becoming children of God and knowing him intimately at Father. Once again, I talk about this in greater depth last week, and so I'd encourage you to engage that teaching first. What we're doing in this multiple part series is we're looking at a list of 20 basic contrasts between the spirit of an orphan or someone who lives as if they, they don't have a father, a heavenly father, and the spirit of sonship. And this list of 20 basic contrasts, this isn't my list, it, it comes from the author Jack Frost um, in his book, Spiritual Slavery to Spiritual Sonship. Last week we looked at the first five out of this list of 20. This week we're looking at, the, uh, at number six through 10, and then we'll, we'll complete the last half of it in the following two weeks. And so picking up in this list, uh, Jack Frost ex expressing, explaining the difference between a person who lives with the spirit of an orphan and a person who lives with the spirit of sonship, he writes the mo about the motive for service, what motivates our service to God. Orphans, Frost writes, serve out of a sense of need for personal achievement as they seek to impress God and others. That is so true. How often are we tempted? Not, not in our sonship. God doesn't tempt us in this way, but you know, out of our own flesh, we are so tempted uh, out of a sense of a need for personal achievement to seek to impress God, to seek his approval as if we can earn it or other people's approvals. Frost writes, sons, on the other hand, joyfully serve out of a motivation driven by a deep sense of gratitude for God's unconditional love and acceptance. And so what is motivating? What motivates your service? Whatever that motive is will actually be an indicator of if we or you or I are living as an adopted, beloved child of God, or if we're living out of a spirit of orphanhood trying to earn his favor or love. All right, the motive behind Christian disciplines. We spent all of Lent within this series of spiritual formation looking at, at some of the historic Christian spiritual disciplines like prayer, fasting, service, and so on. Frost writes, while some orphans are apathetic and possess no motivation for observing Christian discipline, there are those who pursue the Christian disciplines out of a sense of duty 
and a hope of earning God's favor. Once again, the motive there is if I fast, if I pray enough, if I do this, then I will earn God's love. I'll show him how serious I am about my commitment to him. I'll, I'll show him how serious I am to obedience. But that's a, that's a motive out of, once again, underneath that, the motive there is actually to earn God's love rather than to flow from his love. And so sons, Frost writes, find the Christian disciplines a pleasure and a delight rather than a duty. It's a pleasure and a delight to practice the spiritual disciplines because we get to, because this is how God has designed his family to operate in the human life. There's certain practices that we were just made for and prayer and fasting and service and times of solitude with him are all are all parts of our design who we're meant to be and how we're meant to walk out a relationship with him. All right, another motive, motive for purity. Frost writes, orphans believe that they must be holy to be accepted by God. They must be completely pure in order to win his favor and avoid his judgment and wrath. This is a common misconception that people struggle with. You know, I need to get myself right before I can go um, and meet with God. I need to get myself right before I can go worship or go into church. I need to get myself right before I can have God's favor. But that's, in fact, the exact opposite. We come to God completely broken. We come to God knowing our, our full humanity and, and all of our needs for his love. And so Frost writes, sons want to be holy out of love for their father. It is, in, it is natural. I love this sentence. It is natural for sons to take after their fathers. They want to be just like dad. I have three sons and I can see this already in their development. They know my flaws more than anyone else, but they're, they're sometimes blind to them because of their love for me as their father. And so even when I'm short-tempered or, or don't uh, really listen well or pay attention to them or discipline them out of anger rather than out of love, uh, there's so much grace. And, and they, they want to be just like their dad. And this is how we were designed to know God in such a way with such intimacy and such knowledge of who he is and his character that we would want to be just like him. And so our motive for living in obedience is not so that we can earn his love. That's an orphan posture. But rather knowing that we've already received his love, that we flow in it and we want to be just like our heavenly father. And this is the example that Christ set for us. Who didn't, he said, I don't say anything that I don't first hear the father say. I don't do anything that I don't first see him do. And so in, in the life of the firstborn son, Jesus Christ, we see this desire to be just like his dad, and then he passes that on through adoption to us. All right, how about self-image? Orphans, Frost writes, generally possess a low self-image and an attitude of self-rejection, which results from comparing themselves to others and feeling that they come out on the short end of the stick. This is a big one. How often are we tempted to compare ourselves spiritually with other people? I'll never pray like that person. I'll never read as much as that person. I'll never know as much as that person. That's, that's missing the whole point because sons are meant, and Frost expresses it beautifully here, sons feel positive and affirmed because they know how valuable and precious they are to their father. Like I think about my own four children three boys and a daughter. All of them are so different, and some of them are better at other stuff than others. Um, that doesn't mean that there's less value. Some, for some of them, reading comes more naturally. For some of them, riding a bike came more naturally. None of that is an indicator of their value or their worth. It's an indication of their personality. It's just who they are. And there's different gifts and there's different personalities. An orphan is always looking around comparing themselves. I, I, I didn't learn how to read as well as that person. Or I didn't learn how to do this or that as well as that person. So I must be less valuable. No, every, every good father, every good mother looks at their child and says, I love you just the way that you are. And I want you just the way that you are. And my desire for you is to be you, not to be your sibling, not to be your brother or your 
sister. And that's exactly how God approaches you and I individually. His desire is not for me to be anyone other than who he created me to be. And the same for you. So take heart and take joy in who he made you to be. Because when he made you, he said, it's good. It's very good. And he loves you. And he gave himself for you. And he has adopted you through Christ to be his beloved child. Just the person that you are. All right, how about source of comfort? Because they have shut a portion of their heart off from expressed love, orphans seek comfort in counterfeit affections, like addictions, compulsions, escapism, busyness, hyper-religious activity, believing that the busier they are, the happier they are, and the more worthy they are of Father's love. If I do a bunch of stuff, I must be really important. If I'm always serving, I'm always running around doing stuff, it must be that I can earn God's love. But, Frost writes, sons find true comfort in times of quietness and solitude as they rest in Father's presence and love, they have discovered that once having tasted of that place of rest, everything that the world or religiosity has to offer pales in comparison. This is the paradox of spending time in solitude with God. The more that we learn to be quiet and alone with God, the more that the rest of the world and relationships with others actually blossom and open up for us. And so we find our comfort in God rather than in activity. As we, as we draw um, this time to a close today, a few questions to reflect on. What motivates your spiritual activity? Whether it's seeking to live a life of holiness or purity or practicing spiritual disciplines or service of others. What's, what's motivating your spiritual activity? This will be a good indication of, that motive will be a great indicator of, of your spirit if you're seeking uh, God's love from a spirit of an orphan posture or if having received God's love as an adopted beloved child, you're flowing in service from that point. Um, where do you find comfort? Do you find comfort in Netflix? Do you find comfort in overeating? Do you find comfort in hiding? Do you find comfort in uh, too much activity? Or do you find comfort in being alone with God and, and just leaning into his voice and his presence in your life. In what ways might Jesus be inviting you to move from an orphan posture or spirit towards one of sonship? I'd really like to challenge you and invite you to reflect on these questions, especially the last one, before moving on with, I'm sure, what is a busy day for you, and I'm sure you have lots of activity, but just take a moment and think about how might Jesus be inviting you to be a child and to know your place in his family today. Thanks again for joining us um, in this ongoing conversation and journey. It's been great to do this with you. Have a great day. Go with God.